This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we turn to look at the spike in infections of COVID-19 at meatpacking plants, this week the world's biggest pork producer, Smithfield Foods, shut down its processing plant in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, that's responsible for close to 5 percent of U.S. pork production after more than 350 workers at the plant tested positive for COVID-19. That's accounting for nearly half of South Dakota's reported infections. In Pennsylvania, 130 workers tested positive at a Cargill Meat uh, Solutions plant. And a union steward at the JBS Beef Slaughterhouse died last Friday of a coronavirus infection. Deaths of slaughterhouse workers have also been reported in Georgia and Colorado. Many meat processing facilities employ large numbers of immigrants, including undocumented workers. In a few minutes, we'll speak with an advocate for poultry plant workers. But we're beginning with Winona Howder, executive director and founder of Food and Water Watch, author of Foodopoly, the battle over the future of food and farming in America. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Winona. If you can talk about the significance of what's happening, this pandemic exposing the fissures of society, the massive problems we have already, but the idea that in one plant, which they've now been forced forced to shut down. About 350 workers have tested positive. Now, this is in South Dakota, where the governor, Noam, uh, who is a, a Republican governor, has refused to um, impose a, um, a shelter-at-home order. Uh, but can you talk about the significance of this? Yes. Well, this is more evidence that the meat industry is not concerned about public health, not concerned about workers, but just worried about their bottom line. These plants should have been cleaned. Some of them should have been closed down. Let's look at the one in Sioux Falls. That plant is primarily a facility that produces pork for export. There was no reason that this plant had to remain open. It's impossible to do social distancing in a meat plant like this, where workers have to be shoulder to shoulder cutting up carcasses. And what we've seen is that the meat industry has just taken this opportunity to lobby their allies in the Trump administration to get things that we have been able to keep them from getting in the past. For instance, the consolidation that we see in the meat industry. Four companies control 80 percent of beef production, control just under 70 percent of pork production, and around 60 percent of poultry production. They're not satisfied satisfied with that kind of concentration. They have now worked with the Trump administration to get the Department of Justice and the Federal, Federal Trade uh, Agency to agree that they would further weaken merger reviews and are already lax a system for looking at antitrust violations. You know, supposedly we have an economy that's based on competition, but that is absolutely not true, especially in the meat industry. And they're also taking this opportunity to push to privatize meat inspection. They've already done this successfully in the poultry industry, where it's now possible to have line speeds, not 140 chickens a minute, as it used to be, which was already too many, but 175 birds per minute. Now they are pushing to privatize swine inspection. The current law is 1,100 hogs can be slaughtered in an hour with seven meat inspectors, already way too fast. They are pushing to privatize so that there's a uh, no cap on line speed and that um, there'd be only three inspectors yeah. on the line, even though um, the, that means that there would be no inspector seeing if a hog was diseased. 
that well, disease when is called. Winona, Winona, if I can interrupt you for a second, I just wanted to ask you a little bit more in terms of the, the constant trend uh, in, uh, in food production toward factory farms and, as you say, concentration of labor in these huge plants and also the use of immigrant labor for the most part. I'm willing to bet that the bulk of those workers at the Smithfield in South Dakota are Latino and other immigrant workers because that's been the trend in the industry as a whole. Uh, the uh, How all of this works together to make the situation even worse right now? Well, this is uh, the pandemic is really the perfect storm of a completely dysfunctional food system. And yes, the workers at uh, slaughter facilities do tend to be um, Latino and low-income workers, often they're undocumented. And if they push for protections, if they push for a fair wage, the uh, meat industry works with ICE to come in and deport those workers. So it's a terrible situation. We should also remember that the- We just have 30 seconds, Winona, sorry. Okay, the, the way that we produce food has to change because pandemics like this begin in um, situations where animals are being produced, living in their own waste, breathing terrible fumes that give them viruses. And then it only takes a, um, a microbes mutation to cause bacterial and viral diseases. We will see more pandemics if we don't change the way we produce meat in this country, in fact, food, and we need to ban factory farms and stop this terrible concentration that's really threatening our food system. Winona Howder, we want to thank you so much for being with us, executive director and founder of Food and Water Watch, one of the world's leading meat companies, JBSSA, says it'll close its beef facility in Greeley, Colorado, until April 24th, after a 30-year employee died of COVID-19. More than 6,000 people work at that facility. This is one of the workers, 57-year-old Rosario Bustamante. In the beginning, they didn't make any changes. We continued working under the same conditions. No action was taken. They didn't protect us, nothing. The only thing they did was provide hand sanitizer. We started seeing changes when people started getting infected. We found out about people being infected because our supervisor talked to us. That was Monday, March 30th, in the afternoon. He told us, we don't want you close to people. You need to keep your distance because we just learned that the people that were taken from here tested positive to coronavirus. I went to work and I started feeling ill. They took me to an infirmary and they told me to go back to work. Two guys from security overheard and they told me, no, you can't go back to the plant. You need to go home. You have fever. That's when I left, and I spent three days in bed with a high fever, body aches. On Friday, April 3rd, I went to see my doctor, and he told me not to worry, that everything was fine. But he recommended not going back to work. For more on the conditions in meatpacking facilities during the pandemic, we're joined by Magali Lacoli, who is executive director of Enceremos, an advocacy group for poultry plant workers. She's joining us from Springdale, Arkansas, which is home to Tyson Foods headquarters. Um, in these last minutes we have together, Magdalene, if you can talk about the scope of the problem at the poultry plants, and particularly in the midst of this pandemic, who works there? and what are you facing? Yeah, thank you for inviting us. And I think it's important to say that the problems that poultry workers are facing now are no new. However, the lack of benefits are more evident under this crisis. Uh, poultry workers do not have basic benefits. So workers are used to work to, to, work, to, to go to work while sick. And now, with this pandemic, workers are just terrified to go to work. The lack of measurements of these companies to take social distancing to, uh, to prevent the spread is just not evident. So workers are risking their lives. And now they are demanding that these companies provide to them paid C benefits so for them to be able to, to, to be at home and not risking their income. 
uh, right now, many of the companies are taking these measurements of checking in the temperature. However, that is not what workers feel comfortable with because once the worker uh, shows symptoms of fever, it means that the the worker had already been uh, exposed all the workers have been exposed to the virus. So right now there is no transparency of how many workers are being uh, uh, tested positive for COVID-19 and the company is just not providing that information to workers. Um, and, and, and Magali, Magali, what kind of pro uh, protective equipment are, are the workers being provided, if any? Well, right now, like, for example, the Tyson plants, they do not have any masks or gloves. In other plants, they are even uh, the workers have to pay for their mask of gloves. Uh, so they are not even re being granted those uh, basic protective gears to do their work. And can you talk about the um, picking up of the, the pressure to raise the processing uh, line speeds at Tyson? Yes. Yeah. I mean, this issue has—workers uh, have been battling this issue for so long. Right now, um, workers used to process 145 chickens per minute. That led to a long-life injuries to workers. We have five so we seconds. Were, we uh, so right now the workers are more in danger by this line, uh, line speed increase, and so as well as the consumers. We want to thank you for being with us. And, of course, we will revisit this issue. Magali Lecole, Executive Director of Ensoremos, the advocacy group for poultry plant workers. That does it for our show. Democracy Now! working with as few people as possible on site. The majority of our amazing team is working from home. And we thank each and every one of you. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.